Uh, good afternoon, I'm Gus Simmons. Uh, I'm going to share with you a very brief presentation about the great biogas gusher. Now what I mean by that, uh, I'm looking around the room, most of us are probably too young to remember the great oil boom uh, in the uh, turn of the, uh, the millennium uh, back in Texas when we first discovered oil. And uh, we didn't first discover oil in Texas, but Texas was really the start of the, of the boom. And, and everyone went in their backyards and sank an oil well. And so uh, part of my life's work has been trying to help folks visualize everyone putting a digester or a gasifier in their backyard along the lines of uh, what we did with oil wells uh, back when we discovered the prevalence of oil. And the reason for that, uh, I'm getting errors throwing up here at me. The reason for that is because we all have a significant amount of organic waste that's around us at any given time. Most of that organic uh, waste could be used to uh, derive some form of an energy product. So, I'm going to talk with you for a few minutes today about uh, what I could envision being the great biogas gusher uh, and maybe what some of the inhibitors are as to why we're not seeing that and maybe some of the lessons that we would, uh, could take away from uh, the development of resources such as uh, oil and natural gas uh, in the past. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, so uh, you may remember that the great Texas oil boom or the gusher age as it was called it provided for very dramatic economic growth in the United States. It was really the catalyst uh, that helped us to promote uh, expansion of roads, expansion of railroad, expansion of all kinds of infrastructure. Finding and realizing that energy source really propelled our economy. And so hopefully uh, during this conference and the work that you're all doing, we can continue to keep that in mind relative to deriving worth out of our waste products and what it could do to propelling our economy. Uh, the United States became the world's top producer of petroleum and really we rose to be a superpower primarily to begin with because of energy dominance not military dominance uh, and that's what really drove us to be a superpower because of the economic stimulus that we uh, received from uh, becoming that uh, super economy and superpower relative to energy. But pretty soon the rest of the world caught on and the rest of the world began to find their own oil plays, gas plays and coal and uh, we began to lose ground as the economic superpower that we were. So uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna compare and contrast some of the historical development uh, in the great oil boom, uh, talk about some of the lessons that we should have learned from that process, uh, and I'll hopefully offer some insights into uh, overcoming some of the obstacles that we seem to be uh, uncovering as we all work to, to develop bioenergy systems. Uh, so the, that leads us to the question of will bioenergy be the next gusher? And the answer is it should be uh, because we have, uh, as you all well know, vast organic waste resources here in the United States. And we can uh, take those organic wastes and rather than putting them in the landfill or putting them through a wastewater plant or simply land applying them for the purpose of that carbon rotting and going up into the atmosphere, we can derive the energy value from those organic wastes and use that as part of a complete resource stewardship plan where we couple extracting energy value, extracting nutrient value, sustainable water uh, management programs. So we have a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to, to make good on those resources. Okay, works. So uh, one of the, the phrases that I like to use, and uh, you'll probably hear me say it if, you, if I uh, am able to bother you with a conversation during this week, is as our greatest potential lies above the dirt, not below the dirt. We have more organic waste resources here uh, on the surface uh, in the form of crop residues and stovers, animal manures, food waste, you name it. We have an infinite supply of organics that we can uh, derive energy value out of. Uh, yet we uh, continue to spend a lot of time and effort trying to identify and explore stuff that may be buried feet and feet and feet below the earth's crust. So why is that? Well, let's uh, just compare a little bit uh, between the bioenergy opportunities and fossil fuels. Uh, so again, uh, with bioenergy preaching to the choir here, as the saying goes, there's uh, immense positive environmental impacts uh, and improvements that are derived from these types of systems. Uh, provides better air quality through recycling atmospheric carbon. So instead of taking carbon that was buried millions of years ago, well below the Earth's surface and bringing it to the atmosphere, we take stuff that's already above the dirt and recycle it. Uh, so just a simple mass balance approach to uh, improving air quality. Uh, then uh, using these wastes to generate energy allows us to get a, uh, a double dip. We get to repurpose this waste as well as extending the life of infrastructure such as existing landfills. And maybe taking landfills that have got a 10 or 20 year lifespan and converting them to 50 or 60 year lifespans. 
uh, versus fossil fuels. Again, just taking millions and millions of years to take carbon and convert it to a fossil fuel versus an anaerobic digester that can do it in a few days, uh, as an example. Uh, again, fossil fuels, as we consume and utilize those fossil fuels, we're taking carbon that's buried uh, deep beneath the Earth's surface and putting it into the atmosphere. Uh, and then, again, uh, all fossil fuel reserves are projected to decline over time. They're a finite supply versus the infinite supply of organic waste that we're generating on a daily basis. So this is uh, just a simplified uh, carbon cycle that I like to show to sort of reiterate that point. Um, so again, uh, over the course of hundreds of thousands to millions of years, organic stuff that died on the surface of our planet got trapped below the surface. Apply a lot of time, a lot of pressure, a lot of heat, it becomes a fossil fuel. Uh, we can short circuit that by taking those waste and, and taking them to a digester or a gasifier or uh, through a pyrolysis process or some other process to generate that energy value. Uh, if you look at the forecast for our energy consumption, uh, in this particular uh, uh, slide, came, I borrowed the data from the 2052 report, uh, shows the, the thing that we all know, which is our energy sources uh, that come from renewable uh, materials such as organic waste, our, our use of that for generating energy is projected to incline and increase over the course of time, whereas the use of fossil fuels is projected to decrease. So if you want to get on the ground floor of a booming business, uh, bioenergy is the way to go. Uh, so again, that uh, potential for manure in and of itself is enormous. Uh, you guys have all seen the NREL uh, maps that have been produced that depict what the energy resources coming from organic waste look like. Uh, and unlike, uh, for instance, fossil fuels or natural gas plays, uh, the ability to extract energy from these organic resources uh, spans the country. We have these resources quite often in areas where we may not have fossil fuel resources. Uh, food waste being a big component of that. Uh, as you're familiar, usually somewhere between a fifth and a fourth of the uh, municipal waste that we throw in a trash can every day is food waste or a derivative of food waste, easily repurposed into an energy harvesting process. Uh, and whereas in the great uh, oil boom, we were leading the world in this particular case, we tend, tend to be following. Uh, many other countries around the, the globe have caught on and are recycling organics the same way that it's become habit for us to recycle an aluminum can. And so uh, our kids and grandkids are catching on. They're beginning to think about recycling organics, uh, but we've still got a long ways to go. So uh, as you know, uh, 29 states currently have a renewable energy portfolio standard. Some of those states have adopted things like food waste bans from landfills, uh, feeling the pressure of increasing costs from our landfills beginning to, to be filled up by organic waste. And I love this argument with folks who are, are managers of landfill because one of the responses I get from this slide is, well, if you put food waste in a landfill, it still becomes biomethane and we still harvest it, which is true, but you've then dedicated that piece of ground for that use at infinitum. Uh, because once you put the material in landfill and cover it up, it's used, versus a, a tank or a container that you can put material through over and over again. Uh, I'm going to skip to the barriers because I, I know we're going to be running short on time here. So uh, what I attempt to do is identify some of the barriers to these systems uh, becoming implemented. Uh, barrier number one is just the nexus issues. Anytime we make decisions on managing uh, food or water differently than we are, it has an impact on energy and vice versa. Uh, so the, those impacts on water sustainability and food sustainability are uh, driving some of the policy that we're adopting relative to uh, um, bioenergy. And we're going to be uh, facing competing land interest. Uh, I know this has a little bit of a shock value to some people, but I think the question is pertinent. If, as we continue to convert agricultural lands or food production lands into things like solar farms, uh, we uh, hopefully will not question those decisions in the future as our food supplies begin to run nigh. Uh, number two, uh, startup cost. We spent a lot of time talking about it this, uh, at this conference and the overcoming those costs. One of the biggest issues, in my opinion, relative to cost is our expectation on return on investment. We'll invest in nuke plants or coal-fired plants or water and wastewater plants expecting 30, 50, 60 year returns, yet we expect angel investors to help us get a three year return on, a, on an anaerobic digester. And so it's a great inequality as far as our economic expectations. 
uh, the great black hole of information. And that's why I'm uh, so passionate about this group's work and our, our presentations here this week, is we have to get the collective knowledge that's in all of your heads out to the public and to policymakers and elected officials so they can understand how to uh, put forth efforts to address these obstacles. Uh, lack of federal and state standards. Uh, there are a few states who are trying to adopt some standards that are leading the way that other states will likely follow, but we, uh, we have a great lack of standards relative to uh, bioenergy and organic recycling across the country. Uh, risks imposed by fossil fuel markets. So as biofuels or bioenergy is indexed to fossil fuels and the prices of fossil fuels are highly variable, so would be the, the variability in, in bioenergy. And I'm going to get to the end because I know I'm out of time here. Uh, the last one I would talk to you about is competition and priority for funding needs. And this is a big one. We, uh, we're faced every day with funding the gotta-haves instead of the nice-to-haves. And for some reason, we consider bioenergy uh, to be a nice-to-have. And we've got to begin to change our mindset to, for the future, it's going to be a gotta-have. 